Good evening. Today we continue our Eucharistic Adoration Meditations on the 20 Mysteries of the Most Holy Rosary. And we begin once again today with the five glorious mysteries. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive honor, glory, and praise. Revelations 5.12 Worthy indeed is Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world to be given honor, glory, and praise by his intelligent, redeemed creatures who are capable of giving adoration to God Almighty. Adoration is an act of religion that gives just honor, praise, thanksgiving, and glory to God. As the word religion connotes, we are bound together more closely to God in adoration. In adoration, we adore the living, glorious, resurrected Lord. Adoration is composed of four acts, A, C, T, S, of religion and prayer. A, adoration. C, contrition or reparation. T, thanksgiving. S, supplication or petition. A, adoration is the complete acknowledgement, surrender, and submission of our entire self to God. And this is why we kneel and even prostrate ourselves before the most holy monstrance. And contrition, C, is when we make reparation, we repair prayerfully all the sacrileges, mockeries, neglect, blasphemies, and disbelief directed to our Lord in the Blessed Sacrament. Contrition pulverizes, as the word indicates in Latin, all the hardness of heart and mind that prevents our submission of adoration. T, thanksgiving, is what the word Eucharist means. We give our thanks during a holy hour of the greatest gift that God has given to the human race, the gift of himself in the most holy Eucharist. We give thanks to God for our Catholic faith and for our Catholic Church, despite the many weakness and sins of her members. We give thanks to God for our families, for our livelihood and material sufficiency that gives us the time and the freedom to adore God. Supplication, S, or petitions, is our missionary aspect of adoration. In our prayers of supplication or petition, we are prayer warriors beseeching God's healing love and mercy to a nation and a world desperately needing and seeking God's mercy. How powerful our intercessory prayers before our Lord in adoration. Consider the story of the paralyzed man in the stretcher in the second chapter of Mark. There were four men carrying him. Four men were carrying their paralyzed brother and loved one before Jesus to be delivered from his paralysis. Peter's mother-in-law's house was too crowded for him to be carried in from ground level. This represents how often we seek human solutions to problems that need supernatural solutions. These four stretcher bearers, they were not discouraged. They climbed the side of the house and onto the roof. Imagine how difficult that was. Then pulling back the tiles, they lowered him down on four ropes before the presence of our Lord. The Gospels tell us that in seeing their faith, Jesus healed the paralyzed man not only of his physical, but more importantly, 
of his spiritual paralysis of sin. And as we reflect on this story, we need to ask a series of questions. Who are the stretcher bearers of today? You and I. Who is the paralyzed man today? Our loved ones, paralyzed by the fears, paralyzed by their obsessions, their oppressions, their possessions, their doubts, their anxieties, their anger, mortal sins, rejections, etc., etc. We are the prayer warriors of today who every time we make a holy hour before our Lord, holy hours of reparation, we are the stretcher bearers of today, putting our loved ones and paralyzed ones, loved ones in the presence of Jesus to deliver them from their afflictions. It will take time. It takes time. Our faith in the power of the Eucharistic Lord, our Eucharistic Lord who is present to us today as he was 20 centuries ago, is expressed in our persevering prayer before the Blessed Sacrament. Like water dripping on a rock, one drop at a time, we slowly wear down the hardness that caused the sin and the suffering in the first place. Then one day, the hardness of heart, like the rock, will split open, and those who we pray for will be delivered. We win souls one Hail Mary, one Our Father at a time. Faith is defined by Scripture in Hebrews 11.1 1, is faith as the confidence assurance concerning what we hope for and conviction about the things that we do not see. We only adore or not adore what we believe or we don't believe. Ultimately, our faith rests on the divine proof and reality of our Lord's resurrection. St. Paul said, if the Lord has not risen, then we are men, most pitied. Our faith resting on the truth and the fact of the resurrection rests on what was seen by 500 in the Holy Scriptures and its power as expressed in our many Eucharistic miracles throughout the centuries. But what is not fully perceived or experienced is our own personal resurrection when we shall see the Lord in heaven as he is. And this is why we have adoration. Adoration is the closest experience we shall have of heaven next to the holy sacrifice of the Mass. Adoration keeps us sustained in hope that by giving us a foretaste of heaven, it will keep us hungry for the final resurrection and glorification in heaven. Jesus is the Alpha and the Omega. He is the glorious resurrection continuing today in the Holy Eucharist that will lead us to the final resurrection in heaven where those who hunger and thirst for justice will be satisfied to the full and for all eternity. Indeed, the Holy Eucharist is the continuous Easter where the entire Paschal mystery is found. The passion, the death, the resurrection, and the Last Supper of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, in receiving and adoring our Lord in the Holy Eucharist, we experience this continuous application and channeling of the fruits of the resurrection. As the word fruit means, we enjoy and rejoice in the resurrection in the Holy Eucharist, saying, Jesus lives, the resurrection lives. The fullness of Christianity, then, is to experience Jesus really and truly alive and present to us, not only bodily, but as loving us, as beckoning to us, inviting us, enfolding and encompassing us in his loving sacred heart, as we see here in the altar, in his loving sacred heart and in his mercy. 
So if we struggle in this, pray. Pray for the gift of radical faith. Say, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Increase our faith. Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe, and we are convinced that you are the Christ, the Son of God. And so what in, in what does our faith rest on? A concept? Like St. Peter, above our faith rests on the absolute credibility of Jesus Christ himself. God himself, who as God is all good and cannot lie to us or deceive us, and as all-knowing cannot himself be deceived. And so if Jesus is God, then in God, then the God who cannot lie to us speaks to us in the Gospels of today. And if this is true, and it must be if one claims to be a Christian that Jesus is God, what's the problem? What's the problem? Is God a liar? Believe in God, and not in any creature who tries to convince you otherwise. Jesus said in his Eucharistic discourse, John chapters 13 to 17, what must we do to perform the works of God? And the answer, have faith in the one whom he sent. This is the testimony of the Gospels themselves. So every time we adore our Lord, if we adore him with faith, we experience a resurrection, a renewal in our faith. We experience a resurrection of faith, a resurrection of hope, a resurrection of charity, a resurrection of wisdom, strength, and courage. In realizing this, we cry out on earth, as we shall in heaven, worthy is the Lamb to receive honor and glory and praise. He is risen. He is here. My strength and my courage is the Lord. Let us pray without ceasing that Eucharistic adoration spreads like wildfire throughout the whole world, that there may be a resurrection, a renewal of faith in the real presence, in the redemption of man by Jesus of Nazareth, and hope in the peaceful future of mankind. The second glorious mystery, the ascension. The Lamb on the throne will shepherd them. He will lead them through springs of life-giving water and wipe away every tear from their eyes. Revelation 7:17. 7, Our Lord, 40 days after his resurrection, ascended to heaven where he now sits at the right hand of the Father. Yet in the Holy Eucharist remains here on earth. Not only in his divine nature, but in his human nature. And so there in the monstrance during Eucharistic adoration, Jesus throws on earth directly, directly visible in our presence, even more so than his throning in the tabernacle. So understanding, however, that Jesus is throning is not a static one. Jesus' throning is a very powerful, efficacious, and dynamic throning, and one in which his grace, his mercy, his love, and his power radiates into the very depths of our being. Jesus invites us to send with him, to sit at his right hand, to share in his glory as his adopted sons and daughters. And this is what a holy hour is, to bask in the eternal glory of the Father, through the Son, in the Holy Spirit, in the holy radiation of the love of the entire Holy Trinity. We may say that a holy hour is a radical radiation, a radiating divine love, represented by the monstrous starburst that reaches down into the very depths of our being and the very roots of our being. Eucharistic adoration is an hour of sunbathing, not S-U-N bathing, but S-O-N bathing, after which we glow with the love, the mercy, the compassion, and the healing only the sun can bring. 
So in reaching down into the very roots of our being, the divine radical radiation of the holy hour uproots our discontent, our anger, our resentfulness, lightens our burdens and trials by putting them into the light of the cross and the resurrection, where one day we shall ascend to the heavenly throne of God and weep and suffer no more. Isaiah 40, 31 said, They that hope in the Lord will renew their strength, and they will soar as with eagle wings. Do we not spiritually ascend to the throne of God during our adoration hour? Do not experience the thrill of being in the very presence of God himself, almighty God. If we don't, search our conscience. Remove all obstacles to the Holy Spirit, the very spirit of divine love penetrating into our hearts, our minds, bodies, and souls. And then we shall soar. Jesus promised, I will not leave you orphaned. I will come back to you. Know that I'm with you. Always, even until the end of the world. My friends, these are not empty promises. These are the ironclad promises of Almighty God, who is all good, cannot lie or deceive us. Indeed, Jesus delivered his promise to remain with us always by remaining with us today, really, truly, substantially, personally, sacramentally present to us in his body, his blood, his soul, divinity, and in his sacred humanity. The Holy Eucharist is the sacrament of hope and promise that if we continue to receive and to adore him, we shall have eternal life as promised in the sixth chapter of the Gospel of John. In Eucharistic adoration, Jesus fulfills the promise of being the Good Shepherd from his throne and elsewhere. I am the gate. Who enter, whoever enters through me will be safe. He will go in and out and find pasture. Our Eucharistic adoration chapels and churches are not only spiritual pastures, but places of sanctuary where we retire from the hubbub of the world to take spiritual stock of ourselves, see where we're lacking in our practice of the faith, and we promise to shore up our lagging faith. The Holy Hour is our place of refreshment with the Good Shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And Vernon pastors, he gives me repose. Beside restful waters, he leads me. He refreshes my soul. The third glorious mystery, the descent of the Holy Spirit. I've come to cast fire upon the earth, and would it that be kindled, Luke 13, 49. There's both an ascent and a descent in Eucharistic adoration. In our meditation in the last mystery, we spoke of our experience of ascending to the heavenly throne of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit during our adoration hour. Indeed, we place ourselves before the Eucharistic throne on earth, the monstrance. Yet historically, we can ascend today only because the Holy Spirit, 2,000 years ago, descended on the apostles at Pentecost. It is the Holy Spirit, the divine fire of love, that Jesus gives us the eagle's wings to ascend upwards to be penetrated and transformed with the very love of God that makes this possible. In fact, the very divine fire of love that inflamed the hearts of the apostles is the very divine fire of the love of the sacred heart in the Holy Eucharist that inflames our hearts in adoration today. The sacred heart burns to love both you and I. The Eucharistic heart of Jesus is the source of all love 
because the very spirit that animates the Eucharistic body of Christ and Jesus' sacred heart is the Holy Spirit, who is the divine personification of love itself. Do we want to grow in charity, the divine love that loves others as God loves them? Then let us enter into the very presence of God and of love himself, the source and the fount of charity itself, Jesus who is really present in the Adoration Chapel today. Then as we, as daily flooded with divine love, we will catch fire with this divine love and become full of charity itself. Slowly but surely, this divine fire will burn away our selfishness, our egotism, our obstacles to be burning temple of the Holy Spirit of Charity. We shall really learn to love, to learn to love others for the sake of God. And our capacity to love others will be supernaturally uplifted to the love of Jesus Christ for the entire human race on his cross. And when this happens, we see how our marriages, our priesthood, our religious life, our entire life, becomes supernaturally transformed. And so we must realize that every time we receive our Lord, every time we adore our Lord, we're receiving a tremendous infusion of the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And so the more we are aware and the more we are open to this, the more we shall be healed and have the indwelling presence and power of the Holy Spirit to heal and transform us and transform others, as St. Paul says, thus enabling us to comfort those who are in trouble with the same consolation we received from him. In Eucharistic Adoration, we experience a heart-to-heart, spirit-to-spirit, divine and human intercommunication of love. We open our hearts to the Sacred Heart totally and unconditionally. We open our spirits to the power of the Holy Spirit totally and unconditionally. Again, as St. Paul says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so when we do this, our spirit is renewed and remade. I shall give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. Today, like the apostles, we are sent forth to extend the body and spirit of Christ to the world. And the descent of the Holy Spirit continues today through us, the members of the mystical body of Christ confirmed in the Holy Spirit. And so we continue today to send the Holy Spirit that has been sent to us by Christ, by our enthusiasm, our holy joy, and our fervor in witnessing to the faith. We are ready to be apostles and evangelists of the Holy Spirit by becoming apostles and evangelists of the Holy Eucharist and of adoration. In a certain way, one may say that every holy hour is a Pentecostal experience where we are radiated with the love, the power, the wisdom, the grace, and the fervor of the Holy Spirit. We may even be so bold to say that the foundation of the success of every apostolate depends on our fervor in the Holy Spirit that could we only receive in its fullness from Eucharistic adoration, where the full radiation of the divine love penetrates and radiates into our hearts. There will be no renewal in the Holy Spirit. There will be no Pentecost, no new Pentecost, without renewal of devotion and adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. Why? Because it is through the Eucharistic Sacred Heart of Jesus that the divine love of the Holy Spirit that renews and reunites all things flows. And so we pray that the Holy Spirit of adoration may descend on all creation through our doors to renew our broken human race and renew the face of the earth. Amen. The fourth glorious mystery.
the Assumption of Our Lady, body and soul, into heaven. Happy are they who are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb. Revelation 19.9 As Our Lady was assumed body and soul into heaven and made one with her Son, so are we totally and spiritually assumed into the sacred heart and body of our Lord Jesus when we spend an adoration hour with him. Indeed, did not Jesus assume a true human nature into his divine nature and divine person? Jesus assumed a true human nature so that he could love us with the human heart. Jesus, God, became man while still remaining God in order that man made in the image and likeness of God might more fully manifest the divine image made in us or created in the image and likeness of God. So Our Lady's Assumption, body and soul was a consequence of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, body and soul into heaven. It is also the foreshadowing how, how each and every one of us who are redeemed shall be assumed body and soul to heaven on the last day. And we can be assured that Our Lady as the first holy tabernacle of the Lord adored her son in the years between her passing and his passing. Indeed, we can imitate Our Lady of the Blessed Sacrament whose immaculate heart beat as one with her son's sacred heart. We should have this total immaculate heart to sacred heart identification of Our Lady with her son. And we gain this total identification by our hours of adoration. In fact, we assume a new identity of one whose heart is totally and eucharistically identified with Jesus' sacred heart. And what is this total heart-to-heart -heart Eucharistic identification? When our heart beats, Jesus' sacred heart beats within us. Every breath, every thought, every word, every action of ours comes straight from the Eucharistic heart of Jesus. When anyone looks at us or inside of us, they see, they should see Jesus totally, completely, unequivocally. This total Eucharistic identification is what Jesus said we should strive for in John 17, 21, that all may become one as you, Father, are in me and I in you. I pray that they may all be one in us. Indeed, we might say that our Lord desires the entire human race to be assumed body and soul into heaven, into the most holy trinity. We pray that the entire human race finds their unity in the Holy Eucharist. And so where Jesus is, is where Mary is, and where we and the entire human race should be. We all should be in the total Eucharistic embrace of the sacred heart of our Lord Jesus Christ. One thing I ask of the Lord, the scripture says, this I seek, to dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, that may gaze upon the lovingness of the Lord and contemplate his temple. Our Lady is the mother of God who leads to and points to God. Each Hail Mary prayed in the Eucharistic presence of her son is pleasing to God and opens the sacred heart of her son wider to us. The Immaculate Heart of Mary opens the way to Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life. One may say, why not pray directly to Jesus? Many people who suffer guilt and shame cannot pray to God. Mary opens the way to God introducing us as only a gentle and loving mother can. Imagine combining the power of the Holy Rosary with Eucharistic adoration. One complements the other as our mother contemplates our son. In fact, 
John Paul II has said that the rosary is at its heart a Christological mystery. So the more our hearts are in union with Jesus and Mary on earth, the more shall, they shall be united in heaven. And so our degree of devotion and adoration on earth will be the degree of our glory in heaven. All of us gazing on the Lord's glory are being transformed from glory to glory into his very image of the Lord. Your life is now hidden with Christ and God. When Christ our life appears, you shall appear with him in glory. And he will give us a new form to this lowly body of ours and remake it according to the pattern of his glorified body by his power to subject everything to himself. This is what the Holy Scriptures tell us. Is not our adoration our, our very foretaste of the joy of heaven, where we yearn to see Jesus face to face someday? I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor has entered through the heart of man what God has prepared for those who love him. Allow Jesus to assume you entirely into the embrace of his sacred heart. Nowhere are you more welcomed. Nowhere are you more invited. Nowhere are you more wanted. Nowhere are you more loved than with Jesus Christ really, truly present in the Blessed Sacrament today in his churches and in his adoration chapels. And so in our Eucharistic adoration chapels, heaven has assumed earth into itself because God is really and truly present body, blood, soul, and divinity in a sacred human humanity and a sacred divinity. And so our heavenly assumption begins with our earthly assumption on earth in the Holy Eucharist because each is a communion with God. And so the more we are constantly in communion with God on earth, in our frequent reception and adoration of the Holy Eucharist, the deeper our heavenly communion with God shall be. The fifth glorious mystery, the heavenly coronation of Our Lady in heaven. Indeed, this is the will of my Father, that everyone who looks upon the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life, I will raise him up on the last day. The heavenly crowning of Our Lady is a sign of victory for all who persevere in the Lord. The Holy Scripture says that everyone who looks upon the Son and believes shall have eternal life. This is what we do in Eucharistic Adoration. We look upon our Savior because we believe in his power to save and to heal us as those who in the Old Testament who bitten by a serpent looked upon the bronze serpent and were healed. Our adoration follows upon our belief. Like Our Lady, we gaze upon the one we love, our Lord Jesus Christ, who returns our gaze. He returns our gaze and our love. So I gaze on you in the sanctuary to see your strength and glory, for your love is better than life. Adoring Jesus as Our Lady did from the depths of her humility, Jesus raises us up to the crown of glory, showering us with his grace. Whoever exalts himself shall be humbled, but whoever humbles himself shall be exalted. So Mary then, Our Lady is the preeminent model of the church in her holiness humbleness, purity, and unconditional acceptance of the Father's will. The church is the image of Jesus and Mary, and the crowning victory of Our Lady in her coronation and our Lord in his resurrection is what will happen to the church, the entire church, on the last day. So those who faithfully keep company with Our Lady and make holy hours of reparation will most certainly share in this victory. And so those whose faith is everything, 
whose love of Jesus and Mary is everything, who manifests his love by being with the one they love as much as possible in Eucharistic adoration, will wear the everlasting crown of glory in heaven. And so our crown of thorns, our crown of scorn from those who consider us God fanatics, God freaks, become a crown of glory on the last day. The monstrance is this holy vine from which we draw continuous strength and fruition of all our virtues and good works. I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me, and I in him, will bear much fruit. For without me, you can do nothing. God will not be outdone in generosity. I assure you, my friends, the more we are generous with God, the more God will be generous with us. 30, 60, 100 fold. Ask and you shall receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock. It shall be open to you. And so our holy hour then is already our crowning hour of glory on earth. For here before the presence of God is our true dwelling place on earth. The heavenly Jerusalem on earth. The city of peace admits the city of strife that lies outside. The Holy Eucharist is the fulfillment of God's mysterious plan of the new covenant to bring all things in the heavens and the earth into one under God's headship. The Adoration Chapel is the foreshadowing of all how all the heavens and all the earth shall be renewed as one city of perpetual and eternal adoration of Almighty God. Here everyone shall say, as the scriptures say, who would dare refuse you honor or the glory do your name, our Lords? Since you alone are holy, all shall come and worship in your presence. And salvation is from our God, on the throne and from the Lamb. We said earlier that we look upon Jesus and Jesus looks upon us in Eucharistic adoration. Jesus does not merely look upon us because his look is his power that penetrates us and raises us up into deeper union with him to have the glory to do the humanly impossible like St. Peter who walked on water as long as he held the gaze of Jesus. And this is what happens during the Holy Hour. We learn. We receive the grace to always hold the grace of God, to walk through and over and under the stormy seas of our daily trials, tribulations, and tragedies. If we persist, then, unlike St. Peter, we shall rock, walk right into the arms of Jesus, into his eternal grace of glory, and into the triumph of the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the kingdom of the Sacred Heart of the Triumph that has already been won at the Resurrection.